you're about to learn how to master the right way to draft an employment contract by a lawyer and an HR practice leader. Brought to you by Peel Halton Local Employment Planning Council for our small to medium enterprises webinar series. Today is the fifth installment in our series of six titled Building the Right Employment Contract. I'm Tanil Cooper, your webinar host, moderator, and the communication specialist for the Peel Halton Local Employment Council. Okay, so as we get settled in, a few things to note. We want to hear your voice. There will be interactive polls for you to take part in, and you can submit your burning questions on the right side of the question and answer panel of your GoToWebinar screen. I will be keeping an eye out for all your questions as they fly in, and our guests will answer them after their in-depth presentation. For those who provided questions in advance, the same applies as well. Also, if you missed something one of the presenters said, no worries. Everyone will be getting the recording of today's webinar. Now, and lastly, please expand your screen to get the maximum experience of today's presentation. And now for a mini rundown on our esteemed guest presenters. Meet Joel Smith. He's a resident lawyer from Williams R. Law, where he practices management side labor, employment, and human rights law. Joel regularly presents before employers and human resources professionals and has presented at the HRPA annual conference and trade show. Joel obtained his JD degree from the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. While at law school, Joel was an editor for the University of Toronto Law Review and worked at legal clinics where he assisted clients with workplace safety and insurance and landlord and tenant matters. Prior to law school, Joel obtained a Bachelor of Commerce degree from McGill University. Now, meet Lisa McFarland. She's an HR practice leader that has more than 25 years of experience in the field of human resources, specializing in designing and delivering high quality learning solutions that align with organizational culture and people strategy. As a member of the Williams R HR consulting team, Lisa is dedicated to designing effective for clients focused on promoting leadership capability, evaluate, elevating team performance, and supporting ongoing professional development to drive business outcomes. In the course of her career, Lisa has worked primarily in complex, fast-changing organizations. She has experience working as an HR professional in the pharmaceutical, property management, recruitment solutions, transportation, and education services sectors. She has experience with global organizations and cross-cultural teams within both public and private sectors and in union and non-union environments. Welcome to you both. Okay, I um, guess I'm going with Joel. Are you starting off the presentation today? Or That's Lisa? right, thank you, Tanil. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction. Um, no welcome worries. everyone to the, to the webinar this morning. Uh, just uh, as a quick clarifying point, you should see on your screen there the, the names of both of our firms here. It's Williams HR Law and Williams HR Consulting, where, where I, I and Lisa each respectively uh, practice. So uh, today we wanted to just really talk about the hallmark, uh, one of the hallmarks of the employment relationship, and that's employment agreements, also known in uh, many cases as employment contracts. That's how many of you may, may refer to them. Uh, when we talk about employment contracts or employment agreements today, we'll be talking about the same thing, just so you know right off the bat. So the presentation today is intended to help you understand the importance of employment agreements, uh, how they can benefit you as an employer, and how to ensure they are entered into effectively so that if necessary, the courts can be relied on to enforce them. So the objectives on your screen here are your roadmap for today's presentation. So today we will review the importance of employment agreements, discuss some key provisions that, that you will want to at least consider including in your employment agreements, review strategies for responding to negotiation of terms at the outset of the employment relationship, and explore strategies and best practices in entering into employment agreements and uh, really ensuring that you get the best value from them as, as you can. So the first thing, like I said, we wanna talk about is how employment agreements provide value to your organization. So generally, we're gonna be speaking about the importance of employment agreements. Um, they're a very useful tool, like I said, for employers who have employees that are not unionized. Um, that includes even those employers that have unionized employees, you likely will have some non-unionized staff and employment agreements can be beneficial there. Uh, something I want to mention off the bat to make sure everyone's on the same playing field, 
is that employment agreements generally will not be used in, in unionized environments with unionized employees. Unionized employees will be represented by a collective agreement that's negotiated between the union and the employer in most cases. And in those cases, the collective agreement effectively creates the employment agreement that's, that's entered into between the parties. In very limited circumstances, employers can enter, enter into specific agreements with unionized employees, but those, those circumstances are very limited and it's rarely done. Uh, where that will be done, it's only where the, the collective agreement will actually permit those relationships to be entered into with the employees directly. So employment agreements really benefit both employers and employees by clarifying the terms and conditions of the employment relationship. And of course, they also benefit, benefit employers specifically by giving employers the opportunity to create terms and conditions of the employment relationship to limit exposures and pr protect legal interests. So first of all, as you see here, uh, you, you know, of course, they'll communicate expectations so that everyone's on the same playing field when they start the relationship, as well as the entitlements, the rules, the obligations, the benefits for each employers and employees in the relationship. They're going to provide certainty to the parties so that you can minimize disputes about what the employment relationship entails. They're going to, of course, help you protect your valuable assets. That's using provisions like restrictive covenants, uh, including confidentiality provisions, sometimes non-solicitation provisions, and in rare circumstances, non-competition provisions, along with other provisions as well. Uh, they'll also modify terms that are implied by common law. So common law is judge-made law that, uh, that essentially fills in the gaps where legislation does not uh, create, create obligations and create rights and entitlements for employees. Uh, a really big and probably the most significant aspect of the terms applied by common law that you may want to modify using employment agreements are termination provisions. So termination provisions in employment agreements can allow for predictable termination costs in the employment relationship. So common law, at common law, employees in Ontario, when they're terminated without cause, will be entitled to what's called common law reasonable notice. And that can be a very significant entitlement for employees. It can go up to 24, sometimes even more months of, of notice or pay in lieu of notice. So it, in some circumstances, employees have actually been granted 30 months, two and a half years of notice or pay in lieu of notice upon the end of their employment relationship at common law. Now that's much, much greater than the entitlements under the Employment Standards Act, which is the legislation that governs the vast majority of employment relationships in Ontario, of non-unionized employment relationships in Ontario. So the, the Employment Standards Act minimum entitlements cannot be contracted out of. You have to provide at least that upon termination without cause, but you can contract out of that common law entitlement using these termination provisions. So that's gonna be one of the major, major aspects that you wanna consider when you're entering into employment agreements. It's probably the best way to minimize costs using employment agreements in most relationships. So as a starting point, I just wanna discuss fixed term employment agreements as opposed to indefinite term employment agreements. This is really an important point to consider at the outset, but which, which type of agreement you're going to need. So most agreements in, on, in, in Ontario and in Canada are going to be for an indefinite term, meaning they can only be terminated by providing the applicable period of notice of termination required by law, whether that's at common law or the contract of employment and of course the Employment Standards Act. Fixed term agreements can be used, uh, but and they're typically used or intended to be used for employees who will be employed only for a predetermined limited period of time. They can be valuable, but you really need to make sure that you use them cautiously. So fixed term agreements will provide benefits, like I say, only if they're properly used. Uh, one of the big benefits of a fixed term agreement is that you won't be required to provide notice of termination at the end of the relationship. Uh, because the relationship will be for a fixed term, it ends on a certain date that's predetermined before the relationship starts. And when that date comes, the agreement is over. Uh, at that point, you won't have to provide any further notice of termination that they would otherwise have been entitled to in most cases. But you want to keep in mind that under the Employment Standards Act, there's a regulation, it's Regulation 28801, where statutory notice, notice under the Employment Standards Act will be all will be required to be provided if the employment agreement is a fixed term that exceeds 12 months, or if the employment ends before the end of the fixed term, even if it is less than 12 months. And or if it's extended beyond three months after the expiry of the fixed term. So if a fixed term agreement is entered into and then it's extended again by at least three months, then employees will be entitled to statutory notice under the Employment Standards Act. In addition to that, you, you really want to be sure that you don't use fixed term contracts where you're really intending to have an indefinite term agreement. So where you have employees who have 12, let's say 12, 12 month contracts and they have a automatic renewal clause that kicks in at the end of each each 12 month term or you just renew them back to back to back year after year you keep renewing the fixed term agreement courts will generally look at that and determine that the intention really is to have an indefinite term employment relationship 
but the employer is just merely trying to minimize their liabilities and their costs by calling it a fixed term agreement. In those cases, the courts will look past the contract and determine that in fact, it likely is an indefinite term employment agreement and the employee is entitled to all the entitlements they would be entitled to uh, at law, including of course, common law reasonable notice. So because of that, you wanna be very careful with fixed term agreements. Um, if you aren't going to have a clear fixed term that ends at the end of that term, it's often going to be better to have an indefinite term agreement and just make it very clear what the entitlements are upon termination. So you minimize those, those potential risks of having common law reasonable notice owed at the end of the relationship. So I'm gonna turn it over now to, to Lisa to discuss some of the considerations at the beginning of the employment relationship. Good morning, everyone. Um, so when you're looking for your next employee, there's more to consider than just the employment agreement. And considering in the survey, most of you said that you're going to be hiring in the next month. I just want to uh, mention a couple of things to think about in terms of how your brand is being perceived. You know, it's safe to say that we're all familiar with the concept that during the recruitment process, we can make those instant assumptions about people. And sometimes we judge them harshly, harshly based on you know, external factors like their clothing style, if they have tattoos, or maybe their accent. And so these impressions can be right or wrong, but employers need to understand that candidates are forming their own impressions too. In fact, more than two thirds, that's 70% of candidates are turning down a job if their first impression is substandard. And that could be everything from waiting in the reception too long to other factors that, that come into play. And I'm just gonna put the question out there um, more rhetorically, but did you even know that your employer brand and candidate experience are tied together? You know, candidates are increasingly treating job searches like online shopping. You know, part of the research that candidates are doing is wanting to know about your interview process. What are the expectations that you might have and what's your working style? And a Glassdoor report showed that 70% of people looking at online reviews are doing so before they're making any kind of career decision. So they also might leave reviews about their candidate experience. And undoubtedly, they're using platforms like Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Glassdoor, Indeed, to share their experiences of what that recruitment process was like. And in our connected world, you know, we use a lot of the same channels to speak to our customers as we do our clients. So now today, recruiting has shifted to more about treating candidates like customers. And it's important to provide a really positive, consistent, fair, and engaging journey through that mutual evaluation that's going on to find the right fit. A LinkedIn survey found that 26% of candidates who had a bad experience during the applying process would tell family and friends not to apply to that company. And if this is a talented person that you're trying to recruit, you're starting to really dwindle down the um, comparable candidates that they might be putting forward to your organization. So your talent pool might get a little smaller. Also, 25% of candidates have either stopped purchasing or have purchased less from a brand because of that negative candidate experience. So in a really competitive market, this demonstrates how important it is to get the basics right. So some of the pre-offer considerations that I just want to mention is, um, they're important because the value of the employment ag agreement that you're providing is going to be based on their perception from the very first email you send them right to that offer of employment that you're making. And so here's a few activities that can influence the candidate's perception. The first one is to ask yourself, has there been a lack of engagement created during the recruitment process? A lot of artificial intelligence is now being used in recruitment and that could be um, the recruitment uh, technology that screens candidates for you and that makes you lose the ability for both the organization and the candidate to establish a relationship. Uh, maybe those that are actually involved um, in the recruiting process are a little more distanced. They're letting a recruiter take care of it. You know, people don't generally join an organization because they hit it off with a recruiter. You know, the, the terms of your employment agreement take on a lot more significance when that relationship is a little bit more thin. So you have to make sure that everyone uh, is as attentive and engaged as the would expect the candidates to be during the process. Otherwise, you risk on missing out on the best talent. The next question to ask is, is all the information available uh, when the offer is being presented to the candidate? A lot of times we don't think about giving them their actual job description so that they're really clear on the responsibilities. And it also makes you um, 
avoid over promising the role because they get a chance to really look at it because you don't know during the recruitment process what kind of questions are coming up and what kind of expectations they may have started to uh, picture the role as and so the job description helps again re-establish that benchmark of what their scope of responsibilities will be also providing an employee handbook at the time of offer. That really informs the candidate about the expectations and how the employment relationship is to be between them and the employer, especially if you want to talk about the code of conduct or any kind of social media policies that you might have in there that are going to be important for your organization in terms of how it wants to behave or the culture that it might have. You'll also want to ask yourself if you're giving them enough time to consider the offer presented. And I know Joel might speak on that a little bit later in terms of the time frame, but you don't want to be too pushy. You know, if there's any hesitancy by the candidate, give them time. Uh, simply saying something like, I know this is a lot of information at once, but I'm here for you during this process. Um, why don't we connect in a few days? Something as simple as that really, again, helps to establish a really good rapport which may come back when it comes to salary negotiations, which we will touch on a little bit later in this webinar. You also want to make sure that you're a resource for that person at the time so that they have a chance to ask any questions and any adjustments regarding the offer. And you also want to highlight any kind of onboarding plan that you might have. Um, because really, it doesn't stop with the employment agreement. You also want to make sure you're setting them up for success. So touching on it again as a pre-offer consideration, letting them know that they've made the right decision in terms of accepting your offer can go a long way. And so employment agreements really are the start of the employment relationship uh, to make sure that it gets off on a positive note. But they also serve as the legal basis for the relationship. And so before you send the employment contract to the chosen candidate, you really should make sure that you're satisfied with the terms and conditions that have been spelled out for the new employee, that they're exactly the way you want them to be. So if you're not sure um, how it could be interpreted, it is best to consult with a lawyer if you have any questions. And so I just wanna hand it back over to Joel to talk about some other con considerations when it comes to a new agreement. Thank you, Lisa. So there are really two legal aspects to keep in mind when you're entering into a new agreement. Uh, of course, you know, the provisions of the employment agreement are going to be important. The negotiations with the, with the potential employee are also going to be important. But as far as uh, ensuring that the agreement is going to be enforceable, there are two things to keep in mind. So uh, I'll be talking about consideration, which is the most important thing. But first, I'll just pick up where, where Lisa had mentioned a moment ago, and that's giving employees enough time to consider an employment agreement that you offer to them before determining whether they're going to accept that agreement. Um, so the, the concern there, you want to make sure that an employee has enough time to fully review the agreement, consider what the terms mean, and seek any advice, including legal advice, that they may think is necessary before signing the agreement. Uh, typically, I, I advise clients to offer to provide at least one week uh, if, and if you can provide more time than that, that's great, to consider the agreement and determine whether or not they'll enter into the agreement or try to negotiate for different terms. Uh, if you don't provide enough time, you, risk, you run the risk that the employee can end up in court down the road when you're actually, well, after the employment relationship commences and then you, you have some issue down the road, perhaps there's a termination of employment, and the employee may try to argue that the agreement is not enforceable. And the, the one reason they could say that it's not enforceable is that they had to sign the agreement under duress. So the employer didn't give them enough time to review the terms or understand what they were signing and didn't give them a chance to seek legal advice about what they were signing. And therefore, the court should not actually enforce the agreement because the employee didn't understand it. And courts will will sometimes make that make that type of award and award that to employees so that the employer cannot rely on important provisions in the employment agreement, including those very important termination provisions that I mentioned before, because the employee did not uh, sign it in, without, in the absence of duress. And you know that's going to be a very, very important piece to consider, um, given the importance of those provisions that I spoke about, so you can avoid the issues there. Uh, in addition to that, like I said, even more important than, than ensuring there's no duress at the commencement of the relationship is consideration. So each party to a contract in law, and this is any contract in law, whether it's an employment contract or any other form of, of you know, clear uh, legal contract, each party must give and receive something to make the agreement binding. Um, that something is it's called consideration. So parties have to have to each receive some form of consideration, some something of value in order for the agreement to be binding. If the parties don't each receive something of value that they weren't already entitled to, 
uh, in, in exchange for entering into a contract that the law the law is that the agreement will not be enforced the courts will not enforce that contract so at the beginning of the relationship it's much easier it's pretty clear the consideration is the job itself so the employer is getting an individual who will come in and perform services for them the individual is getting a job for which they'll receive compensation that's consideration for both parties very clear now something you want to ensure is that employees sign their employment agreements at the latest on the day before the start date so uh, the, the most important thing really is that they don't sign the agreement after commencing work because if they start if they sign the agreement after they start work they're not getting the job in exchange for signing the agreement because they already have the job. You've given them the job, they've started the job before actually being required to sign the agreement. So the way that the law looks at that is that they won't actually, uh, you know, they, they had the job regardless of whether they signed it or not. So the, the job itself was not consideration for signing the agreement and they didn't get any new consideration for signing it. They already had the job, the employer didn't provide anything new or additional to them for signing, so the contract won't be enforced. And now I, I said a moment ago, you want to ensure that they sign it at latest the day before their start date. And the reason for that is, you know, it's okay legally, technically for them to sign the agreement before they actually start work on their first day of work. But the, the thing to keep in mind there is what if five years down the line, 10 years down the line, you're trying to rely on that same employment agreement, but it shows that their start date is the same as the same as the date that they actually signed it. How are you going to prove five or 10 years down the line that they actually signed it before they started work and not five minutes after they started working or at the end of the day or some other time. The best way to be able to prove that, in my view, is to ensure that the date that they sign it, where they sign and date, date, date next to their signature, is before their start date. So there can be no dispute as to the fact that they actually did sign it before starting and therefore that they received consideration for signing the agreement. You also, at the beginning of the relationship, want to provide copies of your employee, employee handbook or any other relevant employee policies as well as a copy of the job description to them at the same time as you give them the employment agreement to consider. That way you can ensure that they're also uh, receiving consideration for the terms of the job description and the policies so that you can ensure you can hold them to both what they're expected to do in the job description and their obligations and entitlements under the employee policies or handbook. Now, I will touch a little bit later on consideration for existing employees, um, but just very, very quickly now, uh, as I mentioned, if the agreement is signed after they've started work, they need something additional of value, some additional consideration for the agreement to be enforceable. That includes if they sign it a day after starting or if they're offered a new agreement sometime after commencing work in relation to a raise or, or some other reason the employer wants to implement that agreement at that point. So now I'm going to be discussing some key provisions in the employment in, in, that you want to consider including in your employment agreements. So first of all, I'll just I'll go show you a, a list of some key provisions that I will be speaking to today. So first of all, I'll speak to duties and responsibilities, the probationary period and whether and when you should include that, confidentiality provisions, termination entitlements, so termination provisions, uh, provisions pertaining to layoffs, provisions pertaining to suspension and discipline, and provisions. Uh, discussing your company policies. So first of all, we'll discuss duties and responsibilities. So these, this is a provision that essentially creates a, a general statement of the duties that will be required to perform. You don't need to include all the duties in there. You can just incorporate the job description by reference. That's generally a best practice, so you don't have a, a whole page or two of the duties and responsibilities provision right in the agreement. But you do want to have some statement setting out what their duties will be. And you also want to include some wording to protect to protect against obsolescence. So what that means is uh, if a long service employee has changed positions over the years since their original contract of employment, so let's say they started off in a lower level position and over many, many years are promoted a number of times, receive raises, and they end up in an executive level, level position. In cases like that, courts may not actually enforce uh, an employment agreement that's signed at the beginning of the relationship because that agreement no longer reflects the true nature of the relationship between the parties. So you want to have a provision that says that the that agreement will continue to apply regardless of any promotions or changes to their, their position um, or scope of responsibilities in their employment throughout the relationship. That that provision will help to ensure that courts will will enforce the, um, the agreement even after many, many changes and many years, but they won't necessarily still do so. So the best practice is to actually give them, give employees new agreements whenever they get a promotion or a significant raise to ensure that you're, you're you know, entering into agreements that reflect the nature of the relationship as it changes over time. So next I wanna speak about probationary periods. 
So a lot of employee, employers in Ontario incorrectly assume that all employees are subject to a probationary period, regardless of whether you actually have a provision in the employment agreement about that, because the Employment Standards Act does not require termination pay or notice of termination during the first three months of employment. So if an employee is let go without cause in the first three months under the Employment Standards Act, they're not entitled to any notice of termination. And because probationary periods often are also three months long, employers figure that they don't actually have to have a probationary period clause, they just have one by default. Now, that's not the case. Um, although the Employment Standards Act doesn't provide for any entitlements at termination in the first three months, the common law does. Um, and now the a probationary term can mitigate a common law notice award. Uh, the reason for that is that if you, if you have a probationary period in your employment agreement uh, and you let somebody go because you assess them during the first three months of the, of the relationship or whatever, however long that probationary term is, and you determine in good faith after reasonably giving them a chance to demonstrate that they're suitable for the position, that they're just not suitable for some, some reason that uh, doesn't necessarily amount to just cause at law, then you wouldn't actually have to provide them any common law reasonable notice during that probationary period. And that's where it can be very valuable to you. And now, to be very clear, that term does have to be set, set out in the employment agreement. If it's not, there is no probationary period that just that simply doesn't exist. Um, something to keep in mind, too, is that, you know, of course, it's very helpful to avoid that common law notice obligation at the beginning of the relationship because it's a probationary period. The better thing to do even than that is to have a termination provision that limits the employee to receiving only their statutory minimum entitlements at termination. So if they're let go without cause, pursuant to the clause that you have in the, in the employment agreement. If they're let go in the first three months, they wouldn't get anything because the clause provides that they're only entitled to whatever the minimum entitlements they have at, at, uh, under the statute will be. So next I wanna speak about confidentiality. So confidentiality provisions are provisions that uh, are intended to protect the company or the organization's confidential information, things like client lists or customer lists, trade secrets, financial reports, uh, important company data, financial information, et cetera. Um, there, there's all sorts of different confidential information in the relationship. And so typically you'll wanna have the provision state that the confidentiality obligation with respect to the company's confidential information will survive the end of the employment relationship. That means that even after their employment ends, they still will not be permitted to disclose or rely on or use the company's confidential information. Now, something to keep in mind is that employees have a somewhat limited common law confidentiality obligation. So at common law, all employees owe a duty of fidelity to their employers. And that includes uh, some level of confidentiality obligation with respect to true confidential information of the company. Uh, but really it's best to have a confidentiality provision because the duty of fidelity, you have to rely on the courts to Im Im impose that and agree with you as to the scope of the duty of fidelity and how much confidential information is required to maintain confidential. If you have a confidentiality provision in the employment relationship, you can ensure that the the scope of that, that, that entitlement and that obligation is very, very clear. So there can, there can be no dispute as to whether an employee will be breaching their obligations at law if they disclose some sort of confidential information. So next is a termination provision. I've, I've touched on this a couple of times, of course, today. And as I said before, that's because this is, uh, in my view, the most important provision to have in an employment agreement and the provision that can provide you with the most benefits um, primarily due to cost, but also, of course, due to time because of the, the time it can take to deal with termination entitlements at the end of the relationship. So a termination provision is a, a, a term that, as I said, will limit the employee to something less than their common law termination entitlement. So their common law reasonable notice obligation upon termination without cause. And the termination provision can be as little as the statutory minimum entitlements that the employee is entitled to. So under the Employment Standards Act, Employees are entitled to notice of termination or termination pay, as well as continuation of any benefits that they're entitled to as, as employees um, during the statutory notice period. So that includes things like health and dental benefits. It'll include RRSP plans, pension plans, any sort of benefit plan like that, they'll, their participation will have to continue during that Employment Standards Act minimum notice period, which is up to eight weeks and depends on years of service. In addition to that, certain employees will be entitled to severance pay under the Employment Standards Act, which is an additional uh, entitlement. And so because of that, um, you know, you want to ensure that your, your termination provision will provide no, no more, uh, or I'm sorry, no, no less than the termination and severance pay entitlements under the Employment Standards Act. If your clause can be construed to provide for less than the Employment Standards Act entitlements, the courts will strike it down. Courts have, over the last eight or nine years, been repeatedly ensuring that they will not enforce any termination provision that may 
uh, violate the Employment Standards Act at some point. So you want to ensure that it's it's you know you might meet all those technical legal requirements. Um, now the clause should be very clear as to what the employee will receive upon termination, and it should be very clear that benefits will continue for at least the statutory notice period, like I said, to be consistent with the Employment Standards Act. You also want to ensure that your clause is not vague or ambiguous. So if, if your termination provision can be construed in some other way than you intend, you run the risk that the courts will find it to be ambiguous and then they will not enforce that provision. Uh, so you wanna be very sure, very sure that you're clear about what rights exist upon the termination and exactly what you're intending to provide with that termination clause. The next provision that you want to deal with and ensure that you consider is a temporary layoff clause. So under the Employment Standards Act, employees who are on a temporary layoff, which typically is a layoff of up to 13 weeks, are not entitled to notice of termination or severance pay under the Employment Standards Act. But you need to keep in mind that at common law, there is no right to, to, be, to lay off your employees. So although the Employment Standards Act does not consider the layoff to be a termination, the common law will, unless you have a contractual provision making it clear that you do have the right to lay off your employees. So you wanna reserve that right under the agreement and have a clause that specifically states that if you lay an employee off uh, for the period of time permitted under the Employment Standards Act, that will not constitute a dismissal, that you do have the right as the employer to do that. And that avoids any risk that the employee can take the position that when they're laid off, they've been terminated at law and they're therefore entitled to their common law termination entitlements. The next thing that you want to keep in mind are provisions regarding suspension and discipline. So employers do not have an implied right to suspend employees due to misconduct in most cases. So if an employee is, is uh, guilty of some sort of misconduct or suspected of some sort of misconduct, although employers in many cases will want to suspend that employee for some period of time, whether it's to suspend them during an investigation to determine whether misconduct did, did in fact occur or a, dis a disciplinary suspension after you determine that there was misconduct, um, the courts will sometimes find that such a suspension is not in line with the employer's rights and therefore the employee has been constructively dismissed. So essentially by taking the step to suspend the employee, the employer has terminated the relationship at law and therefore owes the employee their termination entitlements. There's a Supreme Court case about three years ago, a case called Potter, which found that where an administrative suspension was imposed on an employee, so a non-disciplinary suspension, but, but administrative while the employer investigated the situation, um, the Supreme Court found that was not justified to, to impose that suspension. And therefore it, it mounted to, as I say, constructive dismissal. However, you can avoid these risks if you reserve the right in your employment agreements to place an employee on a disciplinary and or a non-disciplinary suspension where circumstances permit. That way you can ensure that the employees will uh, will be allowed to be laid off or suspended uh, without without creating that risk that you're, you're constructively dismissing them and therefore without creating the risk that you're going to owe them their termination entitlements. So now uh, I want to discuss a provision that you want to include in all employment agreements and that's the provision pertaining to your company policies. So of course employee policies uh, including those in employee handbook as well as potentially others they're intended to communicate your expectations, set the tone for the company's culture, limit liability in certain circumstances, save administrative time by assisting with employee orientation and onboarding, and answering questions that may arise during the employment relationship so that your managers, your HR individuals do not actually have to, to field those questions themselves throughout the relationship. So policies are gonna be a very important thing to, to have in your, in your workplace. Now you do want to ensure that employees are bound by those policies. So your employment agreement should include a provision stating that employees will agree to comply with the policies and procedures of the companies. And it should also state that uh, they agree to comply with them as they may be amended as time goes on uh, to ensure that the employees again will be bound by them. And in addition to uh, making sure that employees are bound by them as they're amended, also give the company the right to make new policies and, and state that employees will be bound by those new policies that are created over time. So I mentioned before uh, restrictive covenants, so non-competition provisions and non-solicitation provisions. So these are provisions that I'm sure many, many employers will have heard of that are intended to restrict what employees can do typically after the end of the employment relationship. So a non-competition provision will state 
It depends on what the provision states, but typically it will state something to the effect that the employee is not permitted to work in the same industry within a certain geographic area for a certain period of time after the employment relationship ends. Now, it's important to note that courts will consider those to be by default unenforceable, and it will be up to employers to prove to a court that a non-solicitation provision would not be enough to protect the same legal interests that the employer is trying to protect with a non-competition provision. And the reason for that is, of course, a non-competition provision makes it very difficult for an employee or a former employee to earn a living. So typically the courts will prefer not to enforce those unless it's absolutely necessary. Because of that, a non-solicitation provision is often the better bet. Uh, now, non-solicitation provisions will not always be necessary for all employees. You know, if you if you have an employee that doesn't really deal with your clients, um, typically it won't be reasonable to have a non-solicitation provision in in the eyes of the courts. And also, that provision won't won't really protect your rights very much because it's not likely that they'll be able to use their former relationship with clients to solicit those clients away since they didn't know them during their employment relationship anyway. Um, now, there are two different types of non-solicitation provisions, and that's of clients or customers, and then non-solicitation of employees. Um, in either case, non-solicitation provisions will only be enforced if they're sufficiently limited with respect to different, uh, different types of uh, entitlements. So, uh, they need to be sufficiently limited with respect to the employees or the clients that they're pertaining to. So, for example, uh, you should ensure that your non-solicitation provision is applicable only to employees or clients that the employees being restricted actually worked with directly within the last few months of their employment relationship, whether it's the last six months or the last 12 months of their relationship. Um, in addition, the type of work that's being solicited should also be limited. So the type of work being solicited um, should be restricted only with respect to the type of work that the individual actually performed while they're employed. A very obvious example there is that an employee who is employed as a salesperson should not be restricted from starting a janitorial service completely separate from their sales and soliciting the janitorial business of a client of their former employer. Uh, the courts will not will prefer not to enforce a clause like that that would give them that would give the employer the right to try to restrict that type of solicitation. In addition, the non-solicitation provisions should be limited with respect to how long the employee is restricted. So the shorter the period of the restriction of solicitation, the more likely it is that a court will enforce it. Typically, uh, non-solicitation provisions that exceed two years will not be enforced by the courts. Now, there are a number of other provisions that you want to potentially include. Given, given the timing here, I'm not going to go through these in any detail, but you will be receiving this, this deck after the presentation. And you're, of course, welcome to reach out to us after the presentation to discuss any of these. So some provisions you want to consider are provisions pertaining to the compensation that they're entitled to, whether that's their salary and hourly wage, but also commissions, bonuses, cell phones, car allowances, et cetera. Um, you want to consider provisions speaking to hours of work and overtime. That's going to be a very important one in some circumstances. Pr provisions pertaining to their vacation entitlements, um, their rights with respect to any company provided equipment like cell phones and laptops or cars, um, a full time and attention clause. Clauses pertaining to group benefits and setting out when employees will be uh, sub will be subjected to any sort of employee deductions for benefits and what the benefits may include. Uh, provisions stating what type of expenses will be permitted. And then I also want to just quickly touch on again in very high level some general provisions that you want to include, essentially for legal reasons that I won't get into today, uh, but that will be very helpful. So uh, provision stating that the contract constitutes the entire agreement between the parties. Uh, provision stating that the employee cannot assign their rights and entitlements to another individual. Uh, a provision stating that the employee uh, is, is permitted to be employed by you and is not subject to any other restrictions, such as restrictive covenants by former employers that would limit their ability to work for the new employer. Uh, provision stating that the employer is not waiving its rights to enforce any provision of the agreement where it does not enforce that at some point. Uh, provision stating what the governing law will be, typically for those listening to this webcast, it will be the, on the Ontario laws and Canadian laws as applicable. And provision stating that uh, if there is any provision of the agreement that is found to be unenforceable at law, that provision will be severed from the agreement and the remainder of the agreement will remain in effect. So I'll turn it back over to Lisa now to discuss negotiation. Thanks, Joel. So when it comes to employment contract negotiations, you know, compensation is the most obvious issue. You know, a salary negotiation window exists from the time you offer the candidate uh, the offer until the acceptance of the job by your selected candidate. 
And so the results of this salary negotiation can leave a candidate feeling wanted by your organization or devalued. And the results of the negotiation can leave the employer excited to welcome the candidate or feel that they've lost. So there's some new legislation that I want to um, let you know about. You've probably seen it, but if you haven't, I want to let you know about it, that it imposes new requirements on employers to include information about the expected compensation or range of compensation for a position that's in any publicly advertised job posting and prohibits employers from seeking information related to the compensation history of applicants. So this helps negotiations and it also hinders negotiations. In the past, a lot of employers would simply ask a candidate, what were you previously making before? And then they could base their negotiations around that or ask them what their salary expectations are. And this is now going to be limited with this Pay Transparency Act that comes into force on January 1st, 2019. Another thing is the second bullet that says they're required to set the expectations. So one of the advantages of posting a job with a, a set range in there is it really helps filter out those candidates that are you know, just willing to settle for any job or maybe they're um, overqualified -quali candidates or underqualified candidates that say, hmm, this is the range I'm looking for. So it does help you from a screening perspective which also helps your negotiations. And it also lets the candidate know what the organization is committed to as a top end of the range. And so there's a few things that determine what the salary will be. And th those factors could include the level in the organization, how scarce are the skills or experience that you need, you know, what is their career progress or experience um, of the individual? You know, are they used to moving quickly? What's fair market for the job that you're willing to fill? You know, do you have salary ranges for the job within your organization? Do you have salary ranges for the job within a geographic region if you're working outside of Ontario? You know, what are the existing economic conditions within the job market, but also within your industry? And you also may have some company specific factors that might affect the salary, um, such as, you know, comparative jobs, or what is your corporate culture? What's your pay philosophy? Or how are you promoting people from within? Or are you always recruiting from external sources? So those are some of the factors. But whatever rate you determine will also be a factor in your salary negotiation decisions. So let's take a look at salary negotiations. There are five um, key things that I want to uh, discuss to help you have that win-win negotiation. Because both the employer and the employee have to leave the negotiation, feeling that they're ready to start that long-term relationship um, and be successful with each other. It's, it can't be one person wins over the other. So the first uh, piece of the salary negotiation is you have to choose the right salary in the first place. You know, you have to ensure that your salary is fair, that it's affordable, and it's attractive to the candidates. You know, when making this decision, it's a good idea to benchmark against other similar companies or do some kind of external market benchmarking to know that your salary ranges are comparable to the region that you're in, as well as Ontario. You know, your candidates, they're gonna be doing their own research. You know, as I said, they're shopping around and already looking and doing things. So they're gonna know by looking at other job postings or maybe even using salary calculators that are online now to figure out what they think would be fair compensation for the work that they're doing. And you have to know what your negotiation limits are. You know, base those limits on your internal salary ranges um, and what you've paid employees in similar positions, what the economic climate is, and again, the job search market. If it's hard to find that candidate, you may want to pay a bit of a premium. Uh, you also have to make sure you're thinking about the profitability of your company, though, when it comes to those negotiations. And be aware that top talent will counter your initial officer, uh, offer, so you really should expect it. And even lower level candidates are looking at negotiating anywhere from a thousand to about five thousand more than you offered is a is a normal occurrence. So you might want to offer a little bit less than the top end of your range just to give you a little bit of leeway when it comes to the negotiations. Another um, strategy is offer a specific amount. You know, most companies like to make offers with round numbers like forty thousand or fifty two thousand. But, but psychologically, if you offer something more specific, like 40,375, it could make the offer seem more thought through and a lot more firm. 
And so there it helps you with minimizing some of the negotiations on salary. That being said, you want to make sure you, are, you identify those areas that may be negotiable. Because if salary is um, not negotiable or it's barely negotiable, first you'll want to make sure you indicate that to the, to the candidate at the very beginning of the offer to help minimize negotiations. But keep in mind that salary is no longer the sole motivator or sole incentive of a lot of candidates now. Um, again, those superior top talent candidates they're going to negotiate with you in other areas that they might find negotiable, such as benefits, what's included in the package, maybe when their eligibility will start. They might want it to start earlier. If the company offers discounts or tuition re and reimbursement or assistance, um, if there's going to be additional paid time off, Joel talked about additional vacation that they may be asking for. Maybe they're looking for a signing bonus or they're looking for some kind of variable bonus. Uh, maybe even a paid smartphone or business cards. Again, that's another thing that we find a lot of people are trying to negotiate up front. Maybe they're looking for relocation expenses or maybe they're looking for lifestyle benefits such as, you know, flexible schedules or gym memberships. And if they have a company car, they might even be looking for electric cars or something that's a little bit more green friendly. So those are things that they might start trying to negotiate with. So when it comes to negotiating these extra pieces, make sure that you highlight the money that they're going to save or the additional money that the organization is spending so that they definitely see more of a tangible um, realization to these other perks. Um, it also lets, you know, let, lets them know that you're really serious about hiring them when you're willing to negotiate some of these other additional pieces. And then lastly, you have to know when to stop. You know, salary negotiations are pretty scary for candidates. They might say the wrong thing at the wrong time because of their nervousness. And sometimes when you go through the negotiation process, it really does reveal this other side of a candidate. Maybe some negative attributes or tendency of the person uh, are coming out and you realize maybe they're not the right fit for you. You know, are they being really difficult in negotiations? Are they asking for way too much? At this point, it's not too late to change your mind. You can still rescind the offer. And that's as simple as putting something in writing, just saying, you know, we're going to be rescinding the offer that we made to you. Thank you um, for applying and we wish you a future luck. And that kind of very simple letter can help do that. So I'm going to just change it. Uh, I'm going to put it back over to Joel, who's going to talk about changing or revising existing agreements. And we recognize the time we're at here, so we'll try to finish off the last few slides fairly quickly so we can have some time for questions. And just so everybody knows, uh, we're happy to spend an extra few minutes answering questions at the end as well to ensure that we can, we can answer whatever questions you might have. So first of all, uh, with revising agreements, the most important thing, as we really touched on before, is again, consideration. Consideration, I'll remind you, is that thing of value that each party has to receive. Uh, in exchange for entering into an, an agreement in order for the agreement to be enforceable. So an agreement that's provided to an existing employee, again, needs to include consideration and it won't be able to be the job itself. Because like I mentioned before, an existing employee is already entitled to the job. So if you're just telling them that the consideration will be ongoing employment, it's not going to be enough because they, ha they have that right anyway. If you didn't want to provide ongoing employment, you would have to provide them with some level of termination entitlements like we spoke about before. So because you're not providing those entitlements to them, the ongoing job is not something new that they're entitled to and therefore won't be enough. Uh, so you'll want to consider what other thing of value that you can provide. And really legally, uh, what you want to consider is that the thing of value you're providing needs to be something that is objectively of value to the individual and not just the company. Um, and it's again something that they're not already going to be entitled to. And I'll turn it over to Lisa to give you some some examples of what consideration might look like. Thanks. Yeah, there's no specific test to determine what constitutes adequate consideration. Um, the nature of this advantage could invariably depend on the type of position that's being held by the employee. Um, some of the considerations may include the obvious ones that if you have an existing employee, maybe you're giving them a raise or you're giving them a promotion. Sometimes it could be um, a little more creative. Maybe it's uh, increasing their vacation pay or health and dental benefits, which ties in to the raise or promotion if you have that kind of leeway. But it could be offering them their birthday as a day off or providing them with an extra day of holiday. 
And if you have a lot of um, millennials in your workforce, you may even want to think of that additional day off, uh, tying it into a volunteer day. It would still be a, a day off that they could take of their own choosing. But if they wanted to make it a volunteer day, maybe the organization would include the entry fees. And we saw this become a really interesting consideration um, for those that want to give back to the community. Habitat for Humanity was a great example in terms of where it's a full day off, but there's some fees about joining that's done as a charity donation for the event. And so organizations were picking up those entry fees for the participants, giving them a paid day off uh, to use as a volunteer day. Now, if they, going back to what Joel said, it has to be a value. If an employee is not interested in doing it as a volunteer day, you would still default it back to just an additional day off that you could give as consideration. Sometimes it could be additional things like gym membership for a year. Uh, it could be gift cards, any value. It could be for groceries. It could be for something that they particularly like, um, depending on what it is. And I've even seen some do uh, save the best parking space for a period of time. Maybe they get front door uh, parking for one year. And if that's a value for the employee, it's no cost to the organization. And it helps you uh, get that consideration piece in terms of dealing with that change to the contract. So now we'll just jump to the strategies and best practices for you to keep in mind uh, with employment agreements. And this is really just to sum up what we've spoken about today uh, fairly quickly so we can jump into the questions for you. So the first thing to keep in mind is include contractual terms in your employment agreements that will modify implied terms. So implied terms will include the common law reasonable notice that you want to modify by limiting what their termination entitlement might be, or the duty of fidelity's confidentiality obligations and modifying that to perhaps create uh, more stringent or greater confidentiality obligations on the employer, on the employee, I should say. You also want to use them to create contractual terms that will not otherwise be implied. So certain, certain aspects of the relationship will not be implied by law, like confidentiality or termination. That'll include things like uh, use of company property or uh, compensation. Those won't be implied, so you want to create contractual terms that make it very clear what those, what those terms and conditions of the relationship will be. You also, again, like I mentioned before, you want to ensure that you present the employment agreement to the employee prior to hire and ensure that they sign the agreement before starting so that you can make sure that they, they do receive consideration and that they do not sign the agreement under duress so that you can actually rely on the agreement in the effect in the event that there's some sort of dispute often a termination um, but with the employee so you can rely on that at law and in court you also again want to update the employment agreements with each promotion to ensure that the agreement remains relevant to the actual nature of the relationship you want to have your agreements reviewed uh, periodically by a lawyer where you can. And what, what, the reason that's important is that, uh, especially the last decade or so, the courts have really been constantly moving the goalposts. So I mentioned that termination provisions, as an, again, an example, uh, have over the last few years uh, been, been really strictly considered by courts and struck down by courts for very technical reasons. Um, the courts have repeatedly essentially been changing what the test is going to be and what will be considered reasonable or not reasonable in a termination provision to determine whether they'll enforce them. So, uh, uh, you know, many, many times over the last eight or nine years, courts have actually essentially changed what the test will be and whether or not termination provisions will be enforced. So you want to ensure that you're getting your, your agreements reviewed so that anything that is no longer in line with the updated or the current law will, will get up to date and ensure that you can stay protected. And finally, you want to control your templates internally. And this is something that I see all the time with clients. We provide with, we provide clients with uh, certain employment agreement templates that they can use for new hires or existing hires, as the case may be. And then internally, uh, some managers who don't understand the importance, the legal relevance of certain of the provisions will change them. They'll change them because it doesn't make sense to them, or they'll change them as part of negotiations with an individual, or for whatever other reason, they might be changing that. And uh, once that's changed, sometimes that, that revised agreement will become the new template for any future hires or future you know, new agreements for existing employees. And in those cases, uh, you can really run into trouble because if the, if the templates were changed in a way that uh, essentially impacts the employer's legal, uh, legal rights, legal entitlements, then you're going to be entering into new agreements with other employees going forward that are you're not going to be protect you the way that you want them to. So you want to ensure that the templates are controlled and that you do use those templates that have been reviewed by a lawyer so that you don't end up with those, those issues. So that ends this portion of our agreement. We can take some questions now. And in yes. the event that you do have further questions for us specifically, I'll just flip to the next slide here so you do have our contact information available to you. 
Now, before we go to some of the other questions that came in, I know that a few questions were supplied ahead of time where people were asking some questions. So we're just going to address a couple of those before we start taking some more live questions. So one of the questions that came in was, can I put a condition on an employee con uh, contact stating that four weeks notice of leaving your job must be given? And so that is something that, that you can include. So uh, along with termination provisions, you do want, often want to include resignation provisions in your employment agreements. And you can contract for however much notice you deem is reasonable at law. Um, so if you think two weeks is not enough, which is typically the standard that employers will require, then you may you can make it four weeks if you want. You can make it more than that as well. You just want to keep in mind that in the event that you don't want the employee working through the resignation notice period, of course, many employers, when someone resigns, doesn't want them around, don't, don't want them around anymore because they don't expect that they'll be engaged any longer. Um, you'll have to pay them out until the end of that resignation notice period. So consider that when you're determining how long um, the period of notice you want will be. Okay, another question came in was talking about uh, considerations for existing staff and it was sort of a three part question, but we answered the first two parts during the presentation. The last part though said is, can an employee refuse to change their existing employment contract? Yeah, and thank you for, for whichever uh, attendee today brought that question in because that's a very important one for everyone to understand. Employees are not who are already employed are not required to sign a new agreement. They can say no. I'm employed pursuant to the terms and conditions that I'm employed pursuant to, whether that's the implied terms that have been created over the course of the relationship or the terms uh, you know, set out in the existing employment agreement. So they can say no, and as an employer, you're somewhat limited in what you can do, but you do have some options. So of course, you can let the employee go, give them whatever their termination entitlements are under the contract or at common law if there is no enforceable termination provision, uh, and then end the relationship. That's one option. Another option would be to negotiate with the employee and give them more. And that's something that employers will often do uh, in order to get the employee to be willing to sign off on a new contract, enhance whatever the consideration you're providing will be so that they will sign and they'll, they'll see that value there. And then the last thing to do would be to give them working notice of the termination of the relationship. So working notice of whatever their, their legal entitlements to, term, to termination notice are. And then upon the end of the relationship, you offer them the new contract again and say, we're happy for you to remain employed with us, but you, the only way you can be is if you sign this, this contract that we offered you some months ago already. And then if they don't sign at that point, the relationship's over, you've already given them their notice entitlement. So unless they're entitled to severance pay under the ESA, you don't owe them anything more. Um, and, and oftentimes that employee in that case will prefer to maintain their same job with whatever slight modifications might be included in the new agreement. So they'll sign off and you can move forward that way. Of course, that last option is going to have some morale issues. So you want to be very careful before you take that step. So this question was regarding new contracts for employees that are working 10 months and 12 months. And it says, do they get sick days and emergency days? I'm assuming the person, uh, personal emergency leave days. Right. And so those are under the Employment Standards Act, uh, as many of you will now know, with Bill 148 that just started coming into effect in November of last year, uh, with many of the provisions having come into effect January 1st, 2018. That provided two paid personal emergency leave days to all employees, as long as they've been employed for at least a week. And that's all employees in Ontario, no matter how large the employer is. Um, so employees who are employed pursuant to fixed term contracts, like 10 month or 12 month or, or shorter, or even three months, they will still be entitled to those personal emergency leave days unless an exception applies. And the only exception at this point is the construction industry where employees can, instead of receiving two paid personal emergency leave days, receive a slight bump to their wages. Um, and then any emergency leave days they need will be taken uh, as, as unpaid time off. Now, with respect to sick days, um, personal emergency leave can be used for sick days. Uh, and there are certain other um, kind of somewhat similar protected leaves under the Employment Standards Act. But generally, where the, the only uh, legal entitlement that Ontario uh, employees will be entitled to are personal emergency leave days. They're not entitled to some other separate sick days unless your employment agreement or policies provide that they are. Okay, and then the last question we had was regarding uh, unionized staff. And I know we did talk about that during the presentation. It's a, and the question was, what can be added to the letter of offer um, that likely the collective agreement does not cover? And one of the things I wanted to suggest here is that we did talk about an employment handbook. You might want to use a scaled down version of your employment handbook so that it covers policies that are not found in the collective agreement. For example, your harassment and violence policy so that they have expectations of what the organization wants that's not covered. And that's something that you could include as part of the um, hiring uh, package for unionized staff.
Joel, any other thoughts? Yeah, and the one thing to keep in mind there is, uh, you know, once once the employment relationship begins, um, any any employment agreement they signed at the beginning, um, to the extent that that's not consistent with the collective agreement, that will no longer remain in effect. Um, certainly, you can still have policies and employee handbook that apply, and typically those will be imposed pursuant to the management rights clause that you'll have in, a collect, in the collective agreement. And so that's typically, in my view, the best way to provide to you know in, enforce other obligations on your employees that are separate from the collective agreement. Do it through your policies rather than through a separate employment agreement. That'll also avoid. Um, disputes with your union that could result in grievances and, and you know for any unionized employers who are listening today of course you understand that uh, you want to maintain that good relationship because it, it can really cause trouble for you administratively and otherwise uh, if you don't have that type of relationship okay so that's some of the questions that were submitted earlier that we've answered uh, we we are willing to stay on for another uh, few minutes to answer some of your live questions if you have any hi yes so there are a few questions that came in that are live. And as we organize that together, we're just gonna have our one last poll and we wanna find out, do you find it challenging to put together an employment contract? So the attendees that are here, please quickly put your votes in as we get the questions ready. All right, so the first question we have is from Ivanka. Are subcontract, are subcontractors employees? and she's in the consulting industry. And so I'll, I'll take that question. So subcontractors, uh, they may be employees at law. You know, the, the idea is that subcontractors will not be employees at law, but in fact, they'll be individuals in business on their own account. But uh, it, it's, a, it, it's a matter for its own webinar of at least an hour, so I won't get into it in too much detail, but essentially the courts and the Ministry of Labor, along with other government bodies such as the CRA, um, they'll look at relationships with subcontractors and determine whether at law and in fact, these relationships are employment relationships based on essentially the true nature of the relationship, regardless of what the contract might state. And if they find that they're employees at law, a contract stating that they're an independent contractor will not be enforced and they'll be entitled to all the same things that any other employee would be in Ontario. All right, so our next question is from Victoria. If you are hiring a seasonal slash contract employee and their employment contract that says as a seasonal hire, they are not entitled to termination pay, is that non-compliant? So that, that will be compliant provided that your agreement, your fixed term agreement that you're entering into and, and for everyone else there, you'll recall that was one of the first things we spoke about today is you know the importance of ensuring fixed term agreements are done properly and some of the risks there. Um, so in that case, as long as your contract does state the end date of the uh, of the employment relationship and they do remain employed until that end date and they're they're not employed for more than a year which typically of course seasonal employees won't be then that will be fine that will not be inconsistent with the employment standards act and you won't have to give them anything more upon the end of the relationship however if you don't end up uh, ending the relationship on the date you say in the agreement if you let them stay employed beyond that date you run the risk of creating an implied contract of employment of indefinite duration. So essentially going past your fixed term so that at the end of the relationship, if you do try to end it after that date, then the employee will be entitled to notice of termination. So that, that's again, why you just wanna be very careful about entering into those fixed term agreements. All right, so now we have a question from Sarah. What if the employer says they will only give two weeks notice and they expect employees to give four weeks? So an employer saying they'll only give two weeks notice, it will in, virtually every circumstance uh, with the exception of very short-term fixed-term contracts potentially but generally in virtually every circumstance an employer saying they'll only give two weeks notice that will not be consistent with the employment standards act uh, and as long as again this is a provincially regulated employer which most in ontario are uh, and therefore that termination clause will not be enforced and so that employee would be entitled to common law reasonable notice now the the difference between the employees termination uh, notice entitlements and the employees resignation notice obligations that doesn't actually matter at law those can be different and there's no issue with that at law but the termination period does have to be long enough and so because of the the two weeks you mentioned there i wanted to touch on the the concern with that one okay now angela has a question is it a good idea to email the employment agreement before the staff comes into the contract meeting I'm not sure what's meant by contract meeting there, but um, oftentimes it's a it's a good it's a good thing to do to send it as a kind of first step. If the contract, if by contract meeting you mean just to discuss 
and to show them the employment agreement before they're actually required to sign it in, in a few, at least a few days before their relationship will start, then certainly um, it, you, know, it, you don't necessarily need to email it in advance. And I'll see if Lisa has any other thoughts as well. Yeah, from an HR best practice, um, obviously the more time you give somebody to review the contract, uh, then you have a better relationship when it comes to that meeting. So if your contract meeting that you're discussing is about discussing the terms of the contract, you want them to be thinking about it. We all know that there are certain people that are extroverted and cer certain people that are introverted when it comes to having conversations. And those that are introverted want more time to think and process. They don't necessarily like to have things sprung on them. So when it comes to having that offer, you can feel free to email it in advance, even just a, a day before is enough. And then they can come in, at least they've had a chance to think about it, process, talk to friends, family, lawyer, depending on what their perspective is before they enter any kind of negotiations with the employer. And just given that we don't, again, aren't certain of what contract meeting would mean in this in this case, I just wanna reiterate that you wanna ensure that they do have a few days to review the contract before they do have to start work. And you also want to ensure that they, add, that they sign it on, uh, you know, at the latest, the day before their first day of work to ensure it'll be enforceable. All right, we just have three more questions. John asks, safety is important to our company. We're concerned about the, the legalization of marijuana and how we may be able to test after an incident slash accident. Should we put this into the contract that we may be subjecting them to drug alcohol testing after an event, or would this be sufficiently covered when we provide copies of our policy? Uh, that that's a question that we really can't get into now because it creates a whole a whole bunch more legal concerns. Um, drug and alcohol testing just recently was was found to be in very limited circumstances uh, legal, uh, based on a, a a case involving the TTC last year. But there are many, many limitations on drug and alcohol testing, and in many cases, uh, the drug and alcohol testing for employees will not be permitted by law. So uh, for the individual who asked that question, I would recommend that you get specific advice about that one before implementing any sort of a, a drug and alcohol testing regime. All right, Barbara. Barbara says, can an ER add extra responsibilities to an EE job description, even if it's not in their job description, or would this be considered constructive dismissal? So uh, an ER there for, for anyone who doesn't use these terms as, as I do every day, an ER will be employer and EE will be employee. So the question is whether an employer can add additional duties to an employee's job, even if they're not set out in the job description or whether they face constructive dismissal risks there. And uh, and certainly, I think you said it was Barbara who asked that question. Barbara hit the nail on the head to be concerned about constructive dismissal risks there. Um, if an employer adds in significant different duties than the employee was already required to do, there is a risk that the employee could say the employer has, has made a fundamental unilateral change to the significant terms and conditions of the relationship such that constructive dismissal has occurred. Um, the best way to minimize the risks there would be to ensure that you have a duties and responsibilities clause, like I said before, that states that the employee will be required to perform the, du the duties set out in the job description, as well as whatever, whatever other relevant duties and responsibilities the employer may assign as time goes on. Um, that will help give you some more leeway as far as what duties and responsibilities you can provide. But again, you want to be careful uh, that a clause like that will not be forever uh, reliable. Uh, some courts will not allow a clause like that to allow the employer to completely change a job without the employees uh, essentially signing off and agreeing to the changes. All right, fantastic. So that wraps up our question period. Thank you guys for all your intense questions. Um, now, as we are wrapping up a few things to answer today's exit survey question to let us know where we can improve and what topics would interest you in the future. We'll also be sending a follow-up email to today's webinar recording, as well as Joel mentioned earlier that he, uh, they will be sending out their presentation to you after the webinar. Thank you, Joel, and thank you, Lisa. Right, and if you, you yes, uh, and if you would like more local, relevant, and timely labor market information like this, please view our latest report that was featured in the Mississauga and Brampton News, solving local labor market challenges on our website, peelhaltonlepc.com backslash reports. And on behalf of my guest presenters, Joel and Lisa, and the entire team of the Peel Halton Local Employment Planning Council, Council, thank you for joining us and your participation with today's presentation. Please stay tuned for our next webinar on leveraging social media marketing. Until we meet again, we're signing off. Uh, thank you for staying past the designated time. We appreciate your time answering all these questions. And enjoy your day, everyone.
Thanks, Neil. Thanks, everyone. Bye.